Hi, this is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to give you simple, easy to understand strategies, insights and tips to help you master the game of building wealth. And in this episode, I'd like to talk about how property grows. When I say grows, appreciates in value. Because if you understand how property behaves and how markets behave, and then if you understand the idiosyncrasies underlying that behavior, so what has driven the behavior, and then um, how that relates to individual market segments in terms of apartments versus houses, townhouses, and so forth, and then uh, geographical segments within markets, it'll give you a far greater insight uh, for making investment decisions. And when I talk about investment decisions, I'm talking about if you if you currently hold property, you know, decisions around the past performance of those assets and what you could expect in the future. And then also, and probably most importantly, decisions with respect to implementing your plan. Because I believe that you should have a very sound uh, plan rooted in fundamentals, sound fundamentals, evidence-based strategies and so forth. So, so very, uh, very low risk and, and very sound. But when it comes to the implementation of that strategy, perhaps you can be a bit more strategic about it uh, and then position you to enjoy potentially some uh, growth sooner rather than later, but also uh, benefit from the compounding of those returns. And so uh, that's a very long-winded description of what I'd like to talk about in this episode. So let's start with the fact or the quote that history leaves clues. And, you know, you know from listening to my podcast that I'm a big proponent of evidence-based investing. So that is, evidence-based investing means you only adopt a methodology approach or invest in a particular asset where there's overwhelming evidence that demonstrates it works. When I say works, it's going to deliver the returns that you expect. So no throwing at darts at dartboard really only investing in sure things. And what you're trying to do is take advantage of the risk reward calculation, you know, and typically to uh, generate higher returns, you need to accept higher risk. But, you know, some of the best and most wealthiest investors in the the world uh, actually uh, look to uh, almost eliminate risk. And so there is only upside and that's really how they retain and also grow their wealth. So in the show notes of this podcast and in the blog on the website, I've drawn a couple of charts and um, let me just describe them to you. Uh, the first chart's about, I picked an asset in Leslie Street in Richmond in Victoria, which is in the city suburb, uh, about 5Ks or so from the CBD, so pretty close. Um, and, you know, it's an investment grade location. I wouldn't say I'd, I'd invest in every property in Richmond. There's obviously key streets and locations that perform better than others, but it certainly uh, contains a number of investment grade properties. And uh, what I did is picked uh, one at random. In fact, it just one that I came across uh, when I was dealing with a particular client. Uh, and it, um, it's a it's, it's really good uh, example of how property grows. So this apartment uh, first sold in 1985 for about eighty odd thousand dollars, and between and between 1985 and around about 1997, uh, the property transacted uh, three times, Uh, and over that period of time, uh, you know, what's that? Twelve years. um, It um, in 97 it it sold for just under a hundred thousand dollars. So. You know, over that 12-year period, there was 3.8, 3.9% growth. Pretty ordinary, sort of probably during that period of time, that's probably just moving in line with inflation. Now, the investor that bought it in, well, assuming it's the investor, the person that bought it in 1997 uh, did really well because between 97 and around about 2009, uh, the property sold, was bought for about 100 and sold for about, 500,000. So again, over that period of time, so some 13 years, uh, that equates to a growth rate of north of uh, 13%, uh, which I think uh, you would agree is pretty good. Uh, 
the the growth over those two time periods that I've just described, so 85 right through to 2009 or 2010, is 8.8%. But it had really the first 12 years of very little, let's say, no growth. And then the next 12 years was substantial growth. Now, since 2009, the property really hasn't changed very materially in value. It's it's another period of very low growth. And that's uh, and whilst this um, this data isn't statistically significant because it's just one asset, and you'd really need to look hun- look at hundreds and hundreds of assets to build some stati- statistically significant data. I can tell you after 17 years of looking at property growth and individual properties and transactions and so forth, it's very indicative of how property behaves. That is that you'll have a growth cycle and then that's followed by a very flat cycle and then you'll have another growth cycle and then a flat cycle. And those cycles can last anywhere from three to 15 years, you know, so, but If you have an elongated period of flat growth, uh, when I say flat growth, just in line with inflation or maybe, you know, one or two percent, if you have an elongated period, it's typically, there's going to be a lot of pent up demand typically in a market. So then your next period of growth will be even stronger. Uh, And in the show notes, I I, um, pasted a link to another house in Carlton that I used in a blog last year uh, to illustrate this exact point. So there's a couple of assets, but really, I mean, I could um, pick a, a lot of investment grade properties at random to demonstrate this point. Also, I've looked at uh, this phenomenon in median house price data as well. So in the show notes, there's a link to a chart, which I, I think is probably one of the most interesting charts that I've drawn uh, in the last uh, uh, 20 years. I, I think, anyway, I'm... <laughs> I get excited by these things, and that's probably uh, more of a reflection on me than the chart itself. But anyway, uh, and what what I've done is had a look at the distribution of returns in Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane since 1980. So that's some, you know, 38 years of data, which I think is statistically significant. And um, what I did is had a look at the different cycles, you know, and, and there is particularly in Uh, Sydney and Brisbane, there's very defined periods of a growth cycle and then a flat cycle and then a growth cycle and a flat cycle. And for example, let's look at Sydney because between 2005 and 2012, the average growth rate, and remember this is just median data, so of course there's properties that are going to be outliers in both directions, but again, just median data. Um, Between 2005 and 2012, 1.38% nearly 1.5% growth rate over that period of time. Then between 13 and 17, uh, 2013, 2017, uh, just under 14% growth. So, you know, people get really excited, oh, my God, the city market's overheated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's come back a little bit since then. But, um, but really you've got to look at uh, the longer-term trend and realise that markets just move in spurts. Uh, and then that, then a growth spurt is typically followed by a very flat spurt. Uh, the same is true for Brisbane. Uh, for example, between 2001 and 2010, nine-year period, 12.5% growth. Between 2011 and 2018, uh, about 1.5% growth. So, uh, and again, th- there's another period before that and before that. That, that shows a growth per- period and a, a very flat period. Anyway, I would uh, encourage you to just sort of click the link and go and have a look at the chart uh, because if you're interested in property, you're interested in investing, I think it um, it makes for good reading. Uh, the outlier a little bit is Melbourne uh, in that between 1980 and 1998, so nearly a sort of 10-year period, we had about 14%, 14.5% annualised growth. But all the markets did very well in the 80s. Um, thanks, Gordon Gecko. Greed is good. Uh, then between 1990, was really around the recession that we had to have. Thanks, Paul Keating. Uh, and 1996, uh, there was ostensibly no growth, 1.1%, 1.2%. And then since 1997 to 20, 2017, 2018, uh, we've had about 8.4% growth, so a 20-year period of relatively steady growth. 
so Melbourne hasn't really seen the peaks and the troughs, I guess, of, well, not the troughs, the, the, the growth and then the sideways movement that the other, other markets have. But certainly they haven't also um, reached uh, or produced the same level of growth uh, in those peak periods that the other markets have as well. Now, the interesting thing to, um, to note is between uh, 1980 and 2018, so that 38-year period, that if you look at the average growth rate over that period of time for each of those markets, um, that is for Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, the, the results is that they range between 73 and just under 8%. So it's quite a tight range for all of those three capital city markets. So in the long run, growth is actually quite predictable. In the shorter run, it's highly unpredictable. And therefore, it shows that if you had have bought a property and hold on to it for the last 40 years, you would have done incredibly well. But it's possible if you go and buy a property today and you hold it for the next 10 years, it's possible you'll see no returns. So I'm going to get to um, uh, that in a second in terms of how there's two ways that you can use this data and this understanding. I think it's absolutely critical in terms of making good quality decisions. But looking at headline results like that, looking at suburb data, looking at um, uh, capital city median data, uh, those what I would call headline results uh, is somewhat meaningless. You really need to understand what has driven those results. And you need to understand what's, how that market is behaving and what are the drivers and influences because then you can ascertain, um, you can ascertain you know, or at least form a view on what, what might happen in the future. When I say happen in the future, I say where are we in the cycle and you know, what will the next, next cycle show us? So what will the next 10, let's say 5 to 10 year period what is that likely to be? And I think a really good example for me to illustrate this point is investment grade apartments. So whilst uh, the Melbourne house price, median house price between 1997 and 2017, really 2017, really before the market started to slide a little bit, um, eight, nearly 8.5%. So houses have done incredibly well. But investment grade apartments in Melbourne over the last, let's say, eight-ish years, really have not done very well at all. So when I say investment-grade apartments, I'm talking about built 1960s, or 1970s, let's say, or earlier, uh, in really good suburbs, quiet streets, have car parking, uh, maybe there's less than 12 on the block. Typically, the, the block isn't really well used, you know, that there's a lot of surrounding land, and if a developer bought that block today, they'd build probably 30 apartments rather than 10. So very much a strong land value component. And if you have a look at the sales over the last 40 years, you know, it demonstrates up until the last seven years, eight years, demonstrates really good capacity to generate capital growth um, and has a bit of scarcity with it, particularly Art Deco style uh, apartments, you know, that, that sort of architectural style no one's building, but certainly no one's building double brick apartments anymore um, or even single brick for that matter, uh, like in the 70s. Uh, so certainly has a scarcity element there. Anyway, that market, so I've described it re relatively well, I, I'm guessing you know what I'm talking about, that market hasn't done very well in Melbourne over the last eight years. That is, that it's possible that you bought a property that um, is otherwise a perfect property, but you just haven't seen uh, very much growth, if any at all, over that period of time. Now, why is that? We need to understand, well, firstly, the, the point that I'm trying to get uh, across with this episode is that... Um, Growth is rarely linear. You know, it's not uniform. It's not going to happen each and individual year. In fact, it will happen in cycles. And, and you just need to have the patience. You know, if you bought a property uh, seven or eight years ago, it's unfair to call time on the result now. You know, because you're only, if I use an AFL analogy, we're only at quarter time. You know, we've still got three more quarters to, to, to play before. So it's unfair to say, oh, hang on, we're not leading at quarter time, so let's just go home. You know, you've got to wait until the full game plays out. Um, but let's understand, let's really understand what's gone in in the Melbourne market. Well, uh, up until sort of 10-ish years ago, uh, Melbourne was building about uh, between ten and 15,000 new apartments each year. Uh, 
Well, that peaked, that increase, and it peaked a couple of years ago at 35 thousand apartments um, but it's falling significantly now so really we were building a significant amount of new stock and uh, I believe that that new stock was really soaking up all the demand in that apartment sector particularly inner city I mean there's a lot of the apartments around in the city there's a lot in the CBD itself um, around South Bank and and so forth whilst they are um, similar assets or the same assets that I'm talking about they're not investment grade but if you're an own occupier or if you're an uneducated investor, and I would say the vast majority of people that invest in property do so without really a good level of understanding of what makes a good property versus a bad property, in my experience, um, uh, then they all look the same to you. So that that's probably absorbed. Plus, also, if you think about it, the developers have significant marketing budgets. So the property looks shiny and new. They offer some depreciation benefits, all those sorts of things. They've really absorbed probably a lot of the demand. And as a result, you know, the, the older style apartments have just kind of been brushed aside. Why would I invest, Why would I buy that when I can get brand new Miller impli- appliances and uh, stone bench tops? But a, a lot's changed um, over the last couple of years. Firstly, there's been significant tightening in the sales to non-residents. So it was easy to develop something and sell uh, half or more to, to Chinese buyers, non-resident buyers, for example. Well, the, the rules have tightened significantly around that, not with only in terms of Foreign Investment Review Board approval, but also for non-residents to get finance in Australia, incredibly difficult as well. Secondly, borrowing capacity is reduced, I and mean, we've talked about that ad nauseum, uh, but that has a twofold effect. Uh, firstly, it's harder for people to get the finance, so it's harder then for developers to sell to people because there's less people that can afford to, to borrow to buy the asset. Um, but also it's harder for developers to get finance as well. I mean, the, the, the credit squeeze has not only been on residential, but it's also been on commercial and development finance. So it's a bit of a double whammy there. Um, also, as houses have appreciated in value in Melbourne over the last 10 years, but apartments haven't, the, the gap between houses and apartments has extended. So maybe 10 years ago, a particular person had the choice of whether they buy a house or an apartment in Hawthorne, a great suburb of Melbourne, for example. Well, today, maybe they're being priced out of the housing market in Hawthorne and they, they're going to be forced back into that apartment market. Um uh, also, development approvals in Melbourne and Sydney in particular have have uh, reduced significantly. And um, there's, a, there's a link to a chart from uh, Pete Wargent uh, that he's put together. He's put some, he put some fantastic property data together uh, that demonstrates that really the supply of new stock is going to almost fall off of the face of a cliff. And that's going to take a few years, even if it turned around today, if sentiment turned around today, it would still take a few years to sort of turn. It's a big ship to sort of turn. Uh, in terms of pipeline uh, pipeline construction, and there's a few there's been a few major developments in Melbourne that have kind of repurposed. So instead of building a residential tower, they're now building a commercial tower. So I expect a uh, supply of new apartment stock to to uh, to certainly drop off. Plus, also uh, new stock that was being built over the last five years they they wear and tear very easily. You know, after three to five years, they look pretty ordinary and they lose their shine so so the difference really between a brand new apartment and an older style apartment can be quite stark but the difference between a five-year-old apartment and an older style apartment investment grade apartment uh, there's a lot less difference there and in fact um, uh, the way those new, new apartment stock is constructed um, I'd say they look actually inferior and lastly Melbourne's population is growing at around about 100 to 125,000 people a year so even if there is slight oversupply I'm not suggesting there is um, but that sort of population growth is going to uh, soak up any um, excess demand uh, and create some supply shortages particularly if we're building less new style apartments uh, with that level of growth we are going to have a supply shortage in the future. So when looking if we understand that markets move in cycles a growth cycle and then a flat cycle. If we then look and say, okay, Melbourne, um, in Melbourne, investment grade apartments really haven't grown very much over the last sort of a period of a cycle, you know, eight, eight-ish years, um, then we could, we could say we're closer to a growth cycle than we are further away from it. And then if we understand the market and what's been driving that market, then we can form a view on, well, maybe um, because of these changes – 
that set to ignite that market into a, a growth phase. And so that's why I'm saying it's important to understand uh, uh, understand the results because if you look at the apartment market in Brisbane by comparison for example uh, that 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 market is in in the doldrums that they've got a significant oversupply problem and um, and even though uh, overseas migration particularly into Brisbane has picked up um, that, that it's going to take a, a few years to really absorb that oversupply so I, I, I would form a completely different view about apartments in Brisbane than I would what I would about uh, apartments in Melbourne. Okay, so how can you use this information? Now that you understand, you know, uh, that markets move in cycles, very clearly markets move in cycles, uh, that that we then need to understand and dig down into, you know, the types of properties within that market and then the geographical segments within that market and really get a good thorough understanding of what's going on and what's driving that performance so that we can form a view on what the future might hold. Now you know that information, what can you do with it? Well, the first, I think there's two things. The first thing is you need to have patience and discipline. You know, Warren Buffett says that the market is a, is a perfect mechanism from transferring wealth from the impatient to the patient, and that would be true in the stock market. It would equally be true in the property market. If you've bought a property and you've hold on, held on to it and you're convinced, and let me underline this, and you're absolutely convinced that it's a fundamentally sound property, that everything looks great other than the fact it hasn't performed yet and you haven't held that property for, you know, an extended period of time, then just have faith. Realise that it's too early to call time on that investment. Realise that you really need to have the discipline to stick to and believe in the fundamentals of that asset and let time do its thing. So I understand that it can be a bit nerve-wracking if you bought an investment and it hasn't performed, you've held on it for a period of time, it hasn't performed. I get that. But in the long run, you know, in another two or three decades, you know, you, you're not going to um, give it a second thought. Secondly, um, you can use your fundamentally sound strategy, um, but take a strategic tilt to it. So maybe the, the best way to explain this is an example. If I had a client and I developed a plan for a client that involved buying, investing in two properties. Let's say we're going to invest in two properties, make some additional super contributions and maybe eventually in time invest in shares outside super. For example, let's say that's the broad strategy. Well, if the strategy include investing in two properties, let's assume then that those two properties, one house and one apartment. If I had a look at... Um, where the markets are in terms of cycles, I would probably recommend that client invest in an apartment in Melbourne and buy a house in Brisbane. Uh, the, the housing market in Brisbane is substantially different to the apartment market. Uh, and really the, the increase in overseas and interstate migration into Queensland is, has been quite significant. And there is a strong correlation between property growth and overseas and interstate migration. Although interstate migration, which is really mostly coming from New South Wales to Queensland, mostly ends up at the Sunshine and Gold Coast rather than the Brisbane market. Brisbane's uh, significantly more influenced by overseas migration. But anyway, the story remains the same in terms of their kind of leading and lagging indicators, I should say leading indicators of future growth. Um, and I, I believe that market's uh, positioned quite well. And you can, you know, for eight to eight hundred to a million dollars, you can buy yourself a fantastic asset that's, you know, five to eight k's from the CBD with really strong land value component, good historical growth, and and so forth. I'm getting sidetracked. I'm not really here to talk about the Brisbane market. What I'm really here to talk about is the fact that we can take a strategic approach when implementing our very sound investment strategy. And let me cl be clear here, I'm not suggesting you speculate. I'm not suggesting you say, okay, we're going to invest in property. Let's find an up coming suburb in Adelaide, for example, that hasn't had any um, good growth in the past, but because of all this infrastructure, I'm going to invest there and I'm going to form a view that the growth will hopefully, and I'll put that in inverted commas, change in the future. That's not a that's not an evidence based approach. What I'm what I'm talking about is still investing in properties that have a proven track record that are fundamentally sound. But what we're trying to do is pick which markets and which types of assets in those markets represent the best intrinsic value at this given time, given all the information that we know. And even if we're wrong about that information in the short run, in the long run we'll still be right because we've got a fundamentally sound asset.
Okay, so there you are. That's uh, what I wanted to talk about this week. Um, I think uh, the key thing I'd like to leave you with is that, uh, and I know I've got a vested interest in saying this, but it doesn't in itself make it untrue or less valuable, but experience tells me that there's a great amount of value in dealing with someone or getting advice from someone that one doesn't have a vested interest in any particular asset class. So whether you invest in property, shares, super, whatever, who cares? And then two, doesn't have a vested interest in which market or which sector you buy in. So whether you're investing in international or domestic shares or whether you're investing in Sydney, Melbourne or Brisbane, whether it's a house or an apartment, they shouldn't have a vested interest. That way, the person can take a far more strategic approach and adopt a very similar approach to what I'm talking about. And uh, certainly making sure you've got a sound fundamental strategy, but also then helping you be strategic in terms of the implementation of that strategy. I think that's key. And then, of course, then you need to find the right trusted people on the ground in those geographical locations to implement. And it's really important you use a local expert uh, rather than someone that, that's, uh, that's interstate or so forth. They've got to be on the ground. They've got to really know their market. Uh, so I know this is a little bit, a little bit longer than uh, usual. I apologise for that. But it's really important information. And uh, I would strongly encourage you to have a look at the show notes and the blog on the website uh, for more information, particularly in relation to those charts. That's it until next week. Have a fantastic Easter and bye for now. Cheers.